Not too long ago, I was just like you, a newcomer, a little hesitant, but hopeful and ready to be part of something, to feel that connection. And hey, maybe part of the reason God gave us this name is because we feel called to that very purpose. So we're inviting you to fill out a connect card to let us know how we can start reaching out. Are you ready to take your first step? Connection Church, connecting with God, connecting with people. just like you, a newcomer, a little hesitant, but hopeful and ready to be part of something, to feel that connection. And hey, maybe part of the reason God gave us this name is because we feel called to that very purpose. So we're inviting you to fill out a connect card to let us know how we can start reaching out. Are you ready to take your first step? Connection Church, connecting with God, connecting with people.
praise to you this morning, God.
everything else falls apart You're still the one that I'm building on The reason my hope's never lost You're the reason my hope's never lost You're conquered now like you did
some of you already know this, but this is uh, this Sunday is uh, referred to as Palm Sunday, and a lot of people in the church celebrate it because this was the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and he was celebrated for being the Savior. The, the Jewish people didn't really know what kind of Savior he was going to be. They thought he was going to be a political Savior, but uh, he was coming to do so much more than that. But they cried out, Hosanna, and they threw palm branches down before him as he rode into Jerusalem and so you uh, probably heard us sing at the beginning the song Hosanna we're just gonna follow up with another version of Hosanna it's our chance to, to cry out Hosanna meaning save us come Jesus be our king be our savior
Just sing that part one more time. Jesus, that you would heal our hearts, Jesus. Mm, thank you, Father. Heal my heart and make it clean, Jesus. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show Everything we do here, Lord Jesus, is for your kingdom's cause. Everything that we do, Jesus, we don't want to do it without you leading us and guiding us, Jesus. Father, we ask right now, Jesus, that the words of this song Jesus, that you would heal our hearts, Jesus, that you would make us pure, Jesus, in your eyes. Father, we humble ourselves this morning, Jesus, just as you humbled yourself and rode in on a donkey. We humble ourselves this morning, Jesus that you would break our hearts for the things that break your heart, Jesus. And this morning that you would open our eyes, Jesus. Open our eyes, open our hearts this morning, Father. To see how you see things, to see people how you see people, Jesus. We want to be so sensitive, Father. So sensitive, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Maybe just where you're at this morning, can you just give a song of praise and thankfulness? Maybe just lift your hands where you're at and surrender and just say, Jesus, I just want to give you it all this morning, Jesus. I just want to worship you with a clean and pure heart this morning, Jesus, because there's nothing that I can do, nothing that I can say, but it's only by your grace and by your presence, Jesus, that touches my life. Just begin in your own words, just to give him worship, just to pour out on him. Oh, we just want to thank you, Father. 
We thank you for being with us here today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Jesus, that is present with us, that leads us, that guides us each and every day, Father. Father, we just want our eyes and our focus and our affection to be on you, Father. Father, I thank you for each and every person in this room, Jesus, that they will feel a touch from your Holy Spirit, from your presence, Jesus, that we would know, Jesus, your goodness, your faithfulness, and your grace in our lives. And we just thank you in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Maybe just turn to the person next to you. Give them a, a hug, love on somebody this morning, welcome somebody today. We want to welcome you this morning to Connection Church. We are so blessed. We are so happy that you are with us today. So good that you are here. Is there anyone visiting us for the first time? Anyone here visiting for the first time? Can you give us a wave? Welcome, welcome. All right, it's so good to have you this morning. You know what, this, wherever you go, you know, we're in a school, this is the house of the Lord, amen? This is where we gather together. And this morning, I am just so excited to be here today. How many were just to have a sense of excitement? Okay, like five of us, that's really good. That's a good start, I love it, it's so good. Well, we have a few announcements here. Um, if you are new and if you have not filled out a Connect card, we would love to get connected with you. Um, please go to the welcome table at the end of the service at the back. There's Connect cards. There are prayer cards. Please give us that information. We would love to partner with you. We have baptisms happening next week. Yes. And we already have six people getting baptized. Yes, this is exciting. This is a next step in your walk with the Lord. So if you are interested in getting baptized and you have not yet done so, you can go on to our website. There's a registration there. Or you can also talk to Pepe after the service if that's something that you are interested in doing. We are going to have the baptism tank outside. There's going to be warm water. And we are going to have a celebration next week, which is Easter Sunday. Day. Yes, so bring somebody with you, and we are going to also have a sausage sizzle afterwards. Yes, <laughs> so come for that. Uh, yeah, aka hot dogs. Somebody told me that they called it Sausage Sizzle in New Zealand, and I loved that name. Yes, that was Raina. And so I just thought, Sausage Sizzle, ooh, that sounds fun. Anyway, so we have, um, in two weeks from today, we, on April 7th, we are going to be having our five in five. Yes, so please come to that. Um, we are excited. We love to hear what God is stirring in people's hearts. If you've never come to five and five, well, this is an awesome opportunity. We have five different people from our congregation speaking um, for five minutes, and it is just such a blessing to hear and see what God is doing in our midst. You don't want to miss that. April 7th. Uh, we have a women's brunch coming up for all the ladies in the house. How many ladies do we have? Oh, I think we have a few. Oh, yeah. We are super excited. This is actually the first time we're having a ladies' brunch. We're going to be having it at Fireside Grill, and it is going to be April 27th from 9.30 until about noon. Um, please register at the back. For those that have already signed up, there's about 10 people that have already rushed to the back, that have already signed up. We actually have tickets for you. So please go back there again, get your ticket. Um, you can pay either by e-transfer uh, or you can pay in cash at the back table, but you need to have your ticket. So please come to the back table, get registered for that, women. It is going to be a, just such a great time of connecting and being together as the women here in this place. We have youth happening tomorrow night. Yes, so all the youth, 
please come out to the office at 965 Alston, and we are going to have, your teachers have, the, you know what, I just love your uh, youth leaders. We have Megan, we have Stacia, and we have Elijah that are all just so faithful in coming and serving. And so they have prepare stuff for you every week, and there's usually treats, and they are just investing in you. You don't want to miss that, all the youth in the house. We have Tell Me Tuesday, 6.30 every Tuesday morning, and there's a group that goes and prays, and we are seeing the hand of God move. This has been something that they have been doing faithfully for the last five years every Tuesday. And one of the things they do is they pray for all of the people here at Connection. They pray for the churches. They pray for the students. They pray for the government. And we are just seeing things move and shift. And one of those things is that we have been praying for a building. Amen? We have been praying for a permanent location. And we want to also invite you out this coming Wednesday night. We want to invite everybody we want to invite you to come for one hour. We are going to have worship and prayer from 7 to 8 at this new location, which is, can you mark it down? Because I don't think we have it in the back there. It is 3946 Quadra. 3946 Quadra Street. And we just want to spend an hour praying together and this is the start of something amazing. This is the start of a new season. This is the start of something new. And we are so, so excited. You know what? I'm, I'm just going to share this really quickly because last night I had a dream. I'm not going to go into such detail about the dream. But there was many significant things. But one of the things is Pepe and I were in a, um, an Asian country and we were in this woman's home. And in this home, there was... Um, this this person had been had a beautiful home and they overlooked like a lake and there was they had a like art and collections and this was their home and all of a sudden it started to rain and the lady came to us and she said it's time to leave and i said oh well where are we going and she said no it's just time to leave when the waters start rising it is time to leave everything and we must go and so we got up and I was looking around thinking well what about all your things what about all the stuff what about all all the, the the things that you have built and collected and she's like it's okay it's time to go and one of the parts in the dream and 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 they went to the the next house and the next house that they had built was something that was of um, a more permanent structure to avoid the flooding and it didn't matter they had to leave again and this is all in my dream last night and as they left um, she was like you, when you choose to leave, there will always be provision and there will always be food. And I was thinking, for what we are going into, there is going to be provision and there is going to be food. But the water level is rising and I feel like this is prophetic for what is happening in this next season. Maybe this is for your life personally, but I feel like it is also for us corporately as a church that the water levels are rising and it is time for us to move on. Amen? Join us this Wednesday evening. Let's worship and pray together. Amen? All right. Uh, let's just let the kids go to the back. We have Otto waiting for you. Otto is the lion. He is waiting for all the kids to be released. So be released, children. We bless you. We love you. We love your teachers and your helpers. All right. Oh, I love hearing those foot stomping. Let's go. Let's go, kids. All right. And as they go, let's just turn our hearts and our attitude this morning to giving. And let's just bless the offering, bless the tithes that come into this house. And so, Father, we just want to thank, as the uh, sorry, ushers, please, um, you can give um, by envelope or you can give online. 
But, Father, we just want to turn our hearts this morning, turn our attention to you, Jesus, our provider. We just thank you so much, Jesus, that you um, you are it all. You are all in all, Jesus. And we just are so blessed and so um just full of awe, Jesus, of all the things that you do, Jesus. And Father, we thank you for provision. We thank you, Jesus, that where there is lack, Father, that you bring in Jesus. And so, Father, we just turn our eyes to you. We keep our focus on you, Jesus. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God is calling you higher. In every letter to Revelation 7 churches, Jesus is either commending them for remaining strong or challenging them to rise up. It's clear that God does not want a weak, compromising church. He wants a pure bride that is on fire and willing to be strong until his return. It is important to read these letters and examine our hearts looking at how we can step up and grow stronger as believers, who purify our hearts with repentance, not tolerating any sin or idolatry, keeping Jesus as our first love, enduring all persecution and suffering, and remaining passionate about the things of God. How is God calling you higher? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. It's so good to be here. How's everybody doing? You guys doing well? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Um, I do want, I want to say before I go right into the sermon that um, that place that we're going to go look at on Wednesday, we're going to pray. The reason we want to do that is because before we start doing any renovations or anything, we want to go there and dedicate that place to the Lord. But you're going to go there. It is not a place that is ready. It's gonna, it needs a lot of work, and that's the beautiful thing. It's like, you know, it's like when you just get married and then go into a house and you build a house together. It's way better, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so we are going to build this place together. And we're going to go there. It needs a lot of work. It needs, uh, we are working with the architects and the engineers right now. It's going to need of your cooperation financially. We're going to do also some uh, demolition there. I need every single person who feels you are strong to do demolition. Just, we're going to tell you all that information on April the 7th, potentially. Uh, it all depends if I get the keys tomorrow because I was away, so I was supposed to get tomorrow. On the 7th, we are going to have a planning meeting. So uh, we're going to present the project, well, how we're going to do it, how much it's going to cost, and, and all of that. And we want every single person to come. It's going to be after uh, Sunday, um, uh, after the service. It's going to be from 2 to 3. One hour, we're just going to do, do that. And, every, and everybody, you know, we, we just want everybody to participate, everybody to be a part of that. You are not forced or obligated to give a single thing, but it's going to feel good to be a part of building something together. Amen. Something that's going to last for many, many years. We're signing a contract from five to seven to ten years. So we're going to be there for a while. And we're going to make it, you know, simple but nice. Amen. It's going to be, it's going to be a great, a great place, and we're going to build it together. Um, I'm on the last week of the series, uh, the letter to the seven churches. I'm like, oh my goodness, um, I've been enjoying this, this series. I want to say that um, it's in the book of Revelations, and at the beginning, I remember, I want to repeat some of the things that I said at the very beginning. The book of Revelations, you know, sometimes we read it wrong, and that's why a lot of people, if I ask you to raise your hand, who have many people read the book of Revelations, I bet not many people have read that book. Because something, uh, often we read it wrong. We, 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 we have been taught it to read it in the wrong way. And we feel like it's the, yeah, it's the, 
the book of the end times, and, and we read it with fear sometimes, and I don't want to go there, you know, I just want to stay in the Psalms and, and the Proverbs, and you know, and, and, uh, and, and, but the book is an amazing book because it wasn't written, it wasn't, um, it, you know, Jesus didn't inspire John to write it to scare the church or to, or to help us discover who is the beast and which president of the United States is the evil one. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's like what country, you know, what is it going to, the Antichrist and all of that. No, 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 no. That letter to the, to that, uh, um, to uh, the revelation is to encourage the believer to remain faithful despite of everything that was going to happen. Things are getting worse and worse and worse in our world. There is an enemy who is fearful because he is not going to win the battle. And he wants to get as many people involved in believing his lies. But this beautiful letter is to encourage the believer. How can we remain faithful in nowadays? How can we remain just standing strong in the things that Jesus wants us to stay strong? It's actually a beautiful letter if you read it that way. And, uh, and, and so I want to encourage you to go and read the whole thing with the point of where am I there? Because sometimes we cancel uh, the book, when we read the failure of humanity and without even giving a chance to the divinity, the redemption of God. And that's what we find in the, in the Bible. What is what we find in, in the book? Sometimes we get discouraged when we begin to see, oh, but there's things happening and, 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 and things that I get scared of. And, and, and look what they did and look how many people they killed. And uh, yes, it's showing the story of the, the, of the frailty of, and, the, and, and the failure of human without a God. But also in the same book, it shows how good and how amazing the God that we serve is. And I want to encourage you to read it from that perspective. Amen? I want to encourage you to read the book as like, God, what are you in all of this? And you'll see how God is there encouraging the people. And the letter to the seven churches, amazing letters. Different, dealt with different things, different issues of the different churches, but also identify, identify some of the, the issues have identified with our lifestyles and encouragement. Today, I wish this was like in the middle. This letter was in the middle, sort of, a, you know, like a, a very Canadian way, you know, sandwiched with love, encouragement, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, I learned that here in Mexico, it's just tell you that what's wrong, and then we we'll tell you the solution over here. They come with, hey, your son is doing well, and is doing all of these nice things, but I have something against, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I wish that this letter was in the middle, but it's not. It's at the end, and it's a heavy letter, and, and I love that. I love that the fact that we are reading the scripture because it speaks to us directly. It's not a theme that I chose, and I'm going to come against you now as a pastor, as we, you know, some, some of us grew up in churches. But this is a letter, and I want you to put yourself in the picture and, and, and to understand what God is saying to us in different ways. So we can come out of here with a victory, encouraged. Amen. Despise and is a letter that is, is a bit heavy, <laughs> you know. So, um, Lo, Lo, Laodicea, Laodicea was a mega, super rich city, like it would be like the Dubai of today. Um, the Roman in, uh, Empire um, changed the, the roots of where all the, the, the boats and the and the and the uh, all the uh, the businesses were coming into Europe, and they put it right with how this like Laodicea was, and so they began to do a lot of business. Um, they it was a super mega rich city. Uh, they were very well known for their medical school. In the medical school, they had doctors, just amazing doctors, and two of them 
created this mix of ointments with some spices that help with the eyes. I need some of that right now. <laughs> you know, uh, and people had beautiful and, and, and great uh, sights in that place. And people from all over the map would have come to Laodicea to buy this ointment for the eyes. They also had it for the ears. And uh, they were super famous, these two doctors, and they were in the coins, and some really, really, really old coins from back then. You can still see the names of these two famous doctors. It was very well known. One of the things that they had against that city, it was that they didn't have a natural water resources. So they uh, used an aqueduct um, that it came from about six miles. Is that how you say it? Aqueduct? I saw some people laughing there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and they brought it for like about six miles from the south. Um, Laodicea was surrounded by, by these beautiful cities. But one, it was um, a city that had a natural uh, um, hot spring. And, uh, and the other city had really cold, fresh water that brought refreshments and, and provision. And Laodicea didn't have water, so this aqueduct was brought from this place and it, 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 from, from the place where it would have the, the, the hot springs. And by the time it got to the city, that water was a little bit on the, you know, it was, it was lukewarm, it was stinky, it, came, it had minerals, you could not drink the water. So they had to go through a process to, you know, uh, in order for that water to be drinkable water. And um, so um, I want to read the scripture, and, and it's amazing how Jesus, again, introduces himself uh, to the church in a way that it means something to the church. You know, like we read that in every single passage, how um, Jesus introduces himself to the different churches, and it meant something, it, it, whether it was something natural in the city or something that they were dealing with, and that's how Jesus introduces himself to, to, the, to the church. I want to read the scripture, and then I want to go back verse by verse. And it says here in Revelation 3, 14, 22. That's my favorite part, reading the Bible. Come on. Are you there? It says here, write this letter to the angel of the church's Laodicea. It says this is the message from the one who is the amen. He says he's the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm water, like lukewarm water, it's time to make sense. Hmm. Neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Beautiful letter. You say, I am rich. It says, I have everything I want. I, do, I don't need a thing. But don't, you don't realize that you are rich and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It says, so I advise you to buy, to buy from me gold. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy from me white garments. And then you will not be ashamed, ashamed of your nakedness, by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct in discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice I will, and open the door, I will come in. And you will share a meal together. Know this as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on, the, on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Jesus, help us to understand what you're saying to us. Allow us to take this not only as educational but as a personal challenge because we want to change we want to be like you God we thank you Holy Spirit speak to us we open our hearts speak to us Lord in Jesus name we pray amen have you ever had anybody tell you 
that you are you have something in your teeth, perhaps. You know, like you're talking to somebody. If you trust the person, you go, you know, like that. And if you don't trust the person, you just go, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. If you don't know the person, you're talking to somebody, you know, and uh, it's, it's horrible, right? And all of a sudden, it's like, ah, you've been talking to everybody at the church, and you went and they had some maybe refried beans, and you never, you know, it's like those are famous for sticking your teeth. Uh, and, uh, and then you're talking to everybody, and nobody has told you you have something in your mouth. It's horrible, but when somebody tells you, it's not because they want to put you, to make you embarrassed, but they, it's like they want you to look good, right? Uh, we have people like that in our, in, in our lives. You know, like I, I, was, um, I was preaching in one of the, I think in the, uh, to the, to the, um, about the book of uh, Smyrna, and I was saying something wrong. I think I was saying mire. The whole thing I was saying is like, oh, yeah, it's like bringing that spice, the mire. And then after the service, I went home, and, and Kiana, my daughter, comes and says, do you know that you were saying that word wrong the whole time? And, uh, and, it, and it's just so funny because um, often um, we need somebody to tell us that we're doing something, something wrong. Um, I remember one time I was preaching as well, and I come down after the service. And I remember Leah was doing something like that, and it's like, what's like? And I got distracted, right? And, and then it's like, yeah, well, you're going to hate the photos. And I say, why? And you, your, your color was like off. Like one color was down and the other one was up. And I was preaching like that the whole time. And, and it's like, oh, my word. And it's like, what did you tell me? It says, I tried to tell you, but you got distracted. You didn't pay attention and, and things like that. And, uh, and you, know, you know what? We all, need, we all need somebody that will always tell us when we have something wrong with us. The hair is going over there. It's like, hey, just, just, you know what I'm saying? We, we need somebody in our life that trust us enough to tell us when we are wearing something wrong or something like that. And, uh, but also not only physically, only, you know, in the natural, sometimes also on, the, on our lives. Uh, my son, Brandon, just came from, uh, from uh, school. He's in a school. He's participating in a, in a, in a young and old group there with over 400 people. It comes from a, a beautiful leadership there. The, the church is about 25,000 people. They have leaders. They have amazing organization, uh, just everything that they're doing. And my son comes to me and challenged me in some of the things that I was doing or, I'm, you know, I need to improve in my leadership because he has been exposed to a different kind of leadership. And, uh, and at the beginning, you know, it's like, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't know. It's like, I, I like this and things like that. And, and, then, and then it's like, but then I realized, you know what, how am I going to change? How am I going to grow? You know, I need somebody, somebody that loves me that will challenge me, you know, to be better. And I want to be better. I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better spouse. I want to be, you know, a better friend. And, and we need people in our lives that will speak to us with the truth to challenge us. If we want to grow, we need to allow other people to speak to us. Amen? We need God as well. We need God more than anything that will come and have that freedom to speak to us and to speak and point the things that we are doing wrong in our lives, to, to, to open our eyes to see some of the things that we are doing wrong. The church of Laodicea has lost that influence, that, that voice that God had in their lives. And it's like that church it became so, so uh, self-maintained, self, self-rich. And we're going to read through some of the scriptures there. They became so independent that they excluded God in everything that they were doing. They didn't hear his voice anymore. They were not into the prayer meetings anymore. They had the events, but not the presence. Are you with me, church? And it's just amazing how uh, this church uh, lost that relationship with Jesus. They, they got Jesus out of the equation. I remember uh, in the United States many, many, many years ago when it was one of the first, you know, like a shooting in, in, in one of the schools. And they interviewed a lot of people. And one of the persons that got interviewed was um, Billy Graham's daughter. And they say, you're asking me where God is in the middle of all this shooting? But don't you remember that in our, in our, in our schools and, 
and, and we used to pray and we used to read the Bible before we did anything. And you canceled that and you got him out of the school. And she's asking, and she's telling them to the reporters and, the re, and people say, yeah, we did that. And said, so you're asking me where God is? You got him out. And, and, and this church was like that. It was, it was out. They lost that relationship with Jesus. Jesus wasn't the center of everything that they did anymore. And that's why if I want to, I want to start in verse 20. I want to start one in verse 20 when I go move myself up the other way around. And it says in, in, in verse 20, uh, it, it started with saying, look, I stand at the door and knock. And it says, if you hear my voice and open the door, I, I will come in and I will share a meal together. Say it again. As friends. We often use the scripture to, to talk to new believers or, or to unbelievers. and says, Can you, hey, Jesus is knocking on your door and come in and accept Jesus in your heart. And that's probably used in the right way. It's nothing wrong with that. But he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church. He's talking to his church. Somebody say, well, that was a false church. No, he will not call a false church. If it was a false church, it will not be here as a letter to a church. It was his church. He loved that church. And that church got him out. And he's saying, I am knocking at your door. Would you let me in? I want to have a relationship. We lost that, that, that relationship of friendship, that friendship relationship that you and I had before. You know, that passion, the excitement that there is when you just meet Jesus. I've been talking to some of the people. There, was a, there is a man that received Jesus in his heart. He's probably watching on, uh, he, 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 he works away. Uh, you know, like three weeks away in one week here. He's getting baptized next week. He just received Jesus. He's excited about this, man. God bless you if you're watching this. Uh, and, and I've been in communication with him almost every day. He's asking me questions. There is an excitement of knowing Jesus. There is an excitement when you just meet Jesus. But with time, we become professional Christians. And we forget that the, the very reason we are here is because Jesus provided a way to save us so we can have relationship with him. So we can talk to him, that can walk with him. I, I fear the day that I become so professional that I only pray to preach. That I only read the Bible when I'm behind a pulpit. I, I, I fear of the day if... You know, like if, if a church that puts events and does things together, but where is the presence? The presence is gone. Why? Because we lost our relationship with him. Jesus is saying to this church, are you with me, church? He's saying, I'm knocking at your door. Can you let me in? I'm knocking at your door. I want to just pause here and talk to you personally. Have you let Jesus out of your of the question. Have you let Jesus out of the situations that you are dealing with with your family? Have you let Jesus out in your finances, in your businesses? Have you let Jesus out when you are about to write a school, uh, a, a, a test at a school? Where is Jesus in your life right now? Is he inside? Is he leading you? Is he guiding you? Is he inspiring you? Is he whispering to your ears the things that he wants you to do as a relationship with him? What is Jesus in your life? What is he right now? Is he knocking at your door and he's saying, can I come in? Can I have that relationship as a friend with you again? Because he remembers that. But at what point, what happened in our lives that we got so busy that we closed the doors on Jesus? Now, I'm telling you something. All of these letters are not unto salvation. He's talking to saved people. He's not saying do this so you can be saved. They are saved. He's not, he's not telling them because then salvation will be a matter of an action. Then, then, then your salvation will be a matter of the things that you do and not the things of the cross. 
Salvation has been received because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross. He's talking about rewards. He's talking about relationship. He's talking about the crowns that you and I will bring before him one day when we are in front of him to bring us a part of our adoration and our worship. Are you with me, church? He's talking to a church. He wants to. He longs to have relationship with us. Where is Jesus right now in our lives? Where is Jesus? Do we feel Jesus? Is Jesus the number one? That's why, you know, when we are going to go into that new place, I don't, I, I mean, I'm excited about the place, but it will be dead if it is just a place full with people. But the presence is not there. It's the presence of God that we long for. Jesus introduces himself based on that in verse 14. It says, I write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. I love how he comes and says this very thing. He says, this is the message from the one who is the, the what? The amen. The end. People here in Laodicea, they knew where they were going. He is the amen. They knew him. He also said faithful and true witness. And then he says the beginning of God's new creation. If we're going to put these two together, we're going to say they knew who was the beginning. They gave their life to Jesus. They knew when they encountered him. They knew that they are going there. They're going to, that destiny is heaven, is Jesus. He's the beginning. He's the amen. He's the end. But they miss the part where he says, the faithful and true witness, I want to be a witness in your life. I want to be present in your life as a friend, as a master, as a savior, but as a friend. No, as a body that I come and text anytime I want, as my friend who can speak to me. And he's saying to them, they, they, this, this church knew that he was the end. This church then knew that he was the beginning. But they didn't know him anymore as the faithful and true witness. Is Jesus a witness in your everyday life? Oh, he knows everything. Oh, yeah, he knows everything. It's true. But is he a part as a witness, you know that friends know everything? People trying to come to me and say, hey, you know that your friend is doing that? Yeah, I knew that before I even made the decision. I was part of the process. Are you with me? Friends have a relationship. They open their hearts. They express they are part of the process. How many people have friends like that? Man, I just want to do something like that. Friends are not like, a, hey, by the way. You know, and sometimes you have to make decisions like that. It's not like everything you consult. But it's, he wants to be that part of you. He wants to be a, 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 a witness in your life. He wants to be present in your life. Are you with me, church? Jesus, uh, the church of Laodicea have left him out of the equation. Everything uh, they, that they have done since then, he was not present in there. Number, verse 15. Let's continue reading. I told you it's not an easy letter, <laughs> but I love it. I love, like, I love this. I love when the word speaks to me like that. When, you know, it's like I love that good shaking in my head. Like, it's like, what, what? you know what I'm saying? I don't know how many people. So if you're gentle, come back next week. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> We're starting a new uh, series after in two weeks, in three weeks, called Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that stuff. Uh, anyway, so uh, we should call it the Rambo Church. No, there we go. Uh, verse 15, it says, I know all the things you do. Then Jesus said to them, I know all the things you do. You think that you know everything? I know everything you do. You got me out of? Yes, you got me out of. You're missing something. But I know everything you're doing. I'm being there. I'm being watching. It says, it says and, and then he said, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were the one or the other. It says, but since you are lukewarm water, like lukewarm water, I'm sorry again, 
neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> nice, awesome scripture. And, and, and we often, we have to think, you know, like, I, I think I even have preached it. I remember, I, I remember grew up in a church when, they, when the pastor used to come and says, man, come on. You be hot for Jesus. Because if you are lukewarm, if you are compromising, he's going to vomit you from your mouth, from his mouth. And, it, and, it, and it, there's a part that says, I will vomit you from, from, from my mouth. And, and then we think it's like, oh, it's like, ow, oh, it's like, you know, I'm coming out of his mouth. And it's like, and, and it's like, and then we talked about that. And you know what? It helped me a lot to get my life straight. It's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be lukewarm. I want Because I don't want to be cold either. Right? I, I, if I call myself Christian, if I go to church because I want to go, I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be living one foot in the world and then one foot in Jesus. And then I'm lukewarm and he spit me out of his mouth. But he's not talking about that. Though it's a good analysis and it's a good way to preach. And some of you need to hear that. You know? And, and, uh, but what he's saying, and it's like he, he, he's mentioned, you're like lukewarm water. And because they, they were, where they were located, they didn't have natural water. And they had to bring uh, water from six miles away from, from, from where they were. And they got it from a place that it had hot springs. And by the time it got to where they were, that water was lukewarm. It was not good for anything. Why? Because the hot springs was used for healing. People, used to, they, people will go to the hot springs and Sitting there and they breathe. there is a kind of a healing that happened in their bodies. And then he was saying to them, you are not like that hot spring of water that helps for healing. And then here in, uh, in what is the other place? In Colossae, it had also cold springs of water. And the cold springs of water was refreshing, was, was healthy. You know, in the, some of the fancy spots, you go now from a hot spring. And, and then from a hot top, and then you go into, into cold water, super cold water, and that's so good for you. But lukewarm, it's not good for anything, is what they were saying. I was, we, we, we had an opportunity to go with my friends to Iceland uh, last year, and we were in Iceland, and they had beautiful natural hot springs. But we rented a house in Rakitev, in, uh, yeah, in Rakitev. Rakitev is a soccer player. But anyway, Rakovic. And, uh, and we rented a house, and, and my friends are here. And in that house, every time that you went into, you went into the shower to have that shower, that water sting like rotten eggs. And it's like, it came, do you remember that? It came from the hot springs brought into the city. And by the time it got to the city, it smells like rotten eggs. And it had, it had uh, 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 things in there, minerals in there, sulfur. And, and, and it's, it's tank. And it's like it wasn't pleasant to have a shower. And it was like, a, it's your turn. No, it's your turn. And it's like, a, and, and it's like, okay, so now it's like, do I brush my teeth? Do I not brush my teeth? Oh, my word. And it's like, okay, I guess I'm going to brush my teeth. And it's like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like. It was horrible water. It makes you almost puke. Can I speak to you like that? <laughs> I really did. He's saying to them, you are not hot enough to be healing to somebody. You are not cold enough to bring refreshment in the life of somebody. But you're like that lukewarm that nobody wants. You have become like the water in your city. You cannot drink it. Why? Because you say, then you follow me. But you're not living the life. You say you follow me, but you're not helping the poor. You say you follow me, but you're not involved me, involving me in your everyday life. Are you with me, church? Are we doing that ourselves? A believer that is in a relationship with Jesus is a blessing to people. A believer that is 
in a relationship with Jesus is a blessing to humanity. You know, we often think about the prime minister. Oh, the prime minister, he's evil, he's bad, he's woke, he's all of that rubbish that people are believing nowadays. And you know what? He's a lot of that. Uh, God bless him. We pray for him every Tuesday. We bless him and things like that. But we think about this. We think about, you know, the day that we have a, a Christian prime minister. And we are, we are aiming for a Christian prime minister. And we want the, the prime minister to be for the church. And then we are going to live that life that we all want to live. Right? And that's what we want. But that's not a solution. The solution is when the people of God responds to the word of God and becomes healing to the people, refreshment to the people. When it brings that true healing and relationship and the gospel, the answer for Canada to change is not a, a Christian or good prime minister that will support Christianity. The answer for Canada is when you and I wake up. Come on, church. That's when we wake up and we begin to say, I'm going to live for you. I'm not going to be a, a lukewarm Christian. I'm not going to be like somebody that compromises the lifestyle. I am somebody that I'm going I'm to be on fire for you. That's what God wants us to be. God wants us to be this group of people that we are here to be on fire for him. Amen. He's challenging the people. He's like, we need to become a church and say, and this church here in Laodicea has become a church and say, we don't need you. We have everything. Thank you so much. We are prosperous. Look what he says here in, in verse 17. We continue reading here. We're, we're going fast here. We're going to go fast here. It says when, and then verse 17, it says, you say I'm rich. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I'm rich. I have everything I want. You know, and they have fallen into the lies that this mentality of prosperity or money brings. The, the lies that money brings to us. There are a couple of things that, that there is a huge lie that people buy into when they pursue money. And I'm talking about money. We want to read how money is not a problem. It's the love for money that is the problem. It says here, you, you say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize. You don't see the bean. You don't see your color. <laughs> you don't have that. You kick me out. But you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what I think about you. That's what I think about people when they think that they don't need me anymore. They don't know that they are wretched, they are miserable, they are poor, and they are naked. These are some of the lies that living in a lie. They were living in a lie that prosperity was an indication that they are doing well. That's wrong. The church have bought and we're doing well. We have money. We have houses. We have businesses. We don't need Jesus. You know that you see that a lot of that in Canada, whether people have money or not. I remember coming from coming from uh, from Africa, or even from Mexico, from my from my country, seeing miracles. We go to missions and we see miracles. And I remember me one day I was talking to Jonathan Conrad, my friend, and we were there, and then we seeing miracles and blind eyes just open all of a sudden, and and lame people begin to walk. I've seen it with my own eyes. I didn't read it in a book. I've seen it. And I remember saying to Jonathan, says, well, how come the gospel works over there and not here? How come we don't see those things here? He says, because over there they have nobody else to go to. It's Jesus or nothing. And their faith put them in this place of total dependency on a miracle. But in our, in our countries, we have a good medical system. We have what we need. We have what it takes. I really don't need to pray. And we are limited to experience the power of God. Because we think we have everything we need. And that is the mentality. 
This is the mentality that they were having. They were thinking that their prosperity was everything they needed, and they got Jesus out of that. Two lies that money can make you believe as right. Jesus points this out. First of all, he says, he said to them, you say, you say, I'm rich. There is another, uh, that is my translation, the New Living Translation. In all the translations say, I have made myself rich with my own efforts. I, everything I have, it's because of my hard work. And I want to say this to all of us who are here in North America, who live here in Canada. Yeah, we have what we deserve. We have what we have fought for. We have what we have earned with our hands and, and sacrifices. And, 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 and the, you know, it, it is hard work to, to be prosperous. And I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking about generally speaking, whatever you have, you are prosperous. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. But there are things that you don't, you cannot buy, that money cannot buy. You cannot wake up on your own. You open your eyes because there was somebody else that said you're waking up today. Not because you're a hardworking, rich person. Are you with me? There's somebody that allows you to connect with somebody that probably produced that business and took place. Are you with me, church? Can I speak to you like that? And he's saying to them, you say you are rich. You say that you have made everything you have with your own hand, with your own sacrifices, with your own thing. Yes, but what about you recognizing that I am the one that connects you. I am the one that allows you to live today. I am the one that allowing you to breathe today. And another, another, another lie that money or the mentality, the love of money produces is that's all I need. He said, you say I am rich. And I have everything I want. And he's pointed that to them. They told them because they had money and they were prosperous. That's all they need. That's all I need. All the money can buy. And Jesus said, no. You're rich. You're naked. You're poor. You're miserable. Because your money cannot buy you peace. Your money cannot buy you eternal joy. Your money cannot put you to sleep in a nice, peaceful way at night. Your money cannot bring satisfaction into the depth of who you are. Are you with me, church? And they were confusing the things. And Jesus was saying, no, money cannot give you this. And you have forgotten about this. I love this in Deuteronomy 8. Verse 12 to 18. Let's go, let's go there, please. Let's go really fast here. Deuteronomy 8, 12 to 18. I love this part. It says, when, but when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in. Are you reading that? I'm going to read it. Go there or write it down. Deuteronomy 8, 12 to 18. It says, but when you have become full and prosperous and you have built fine homes to live in, does Jesus have a problem with that? He wanted his people to be prosperous. He wanted them to be prosperous, to, to live in fun, fine homes. It says, and when your full flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and your gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. I want you to be prosperous. I want you, your hurts to multiply. I want you to have things. I want you to have money and business and to, be, and to do well. But be careful. It says, do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from the slavery in the land of Egypt. Verse 17. It says here in verse 17. It says, He did all of this so you will never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Verse 18. Remember the Lord your God. 
He is the one who gives you the power to be successful. In order to fulfill the covenant, he confirmed with your ancestors with an oath. He said to his people, I will bless you. I will prosper you. I will multiply your wealth and your blessings. Just don't forget who gave them to you. The church of Laodicea had forgotten that everything they had, it came from the Lord. You know what we tie to the church? Because it makes us recognize that we are dependent on him. We give money, not because Jesus needs money, because it's a form of being grateful that everything that we have, it has come from him. Jesus told his disciples and says, when you pray, it says, Father, give me my daily bread. It's like puts us in this place of dependency like a little child depends on his dad. He just went away and my daughter just mad at me because something, you know, and turns to me later being mad at me and is like, can I have money to buy this? <laughs> it's a total dependency. Jesus said to the disciples, pray to the Father, give me my daily bread. I want to finish with this. Three things, very quickly. Three things that he advised the church of Laodicea to do. This is in his goodness. He rebuked them. He showed them what they were doing wrong. But in his goodness, he called them and says, you can do these three things. Are you ready? Let's go really fast here. So I advise you. I advise you to buy gold from me. These people that had all the money in the world and can buy all the gold. He said, buy gold from me. That's way better. That's better gold. It's not a physical world, uh, gold. It's the wisdom. It's the fear. It's the spiritual gold that will not be corrupted. In Job, uh, Job 28, from 1 to 18, I'm not going to read it because it's very long, but you read it. Please read Job 28, 1 to 28. And it shows two kinds of gold. It says here, natural silver and gold. You can find it by mining a mountain. But it says, but the gold that is in the wisdom is found only in the fear of the Lord. He's telling them, he's telling the, 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 the church of Laodicea, you have that gold, but buy from me refined gold. It's the fear of the Lord, the beginning of all wisdom. You don't have that. Buy from me that. It is a natural gold and it's a divine gold. The gold is the character that is formed in us. In Job 23.10, it says here, it says here, uh, Job, I, I, I relate this, uh, this, the life of Job with the church of Laodicea. It's like, it's like, it's like Jesus is... Is sharing everything that Job experienced to tell them because they were prosperous. Same as Job. He was, is, am I saying it right? I, I hope you, Job. It's, it's, it's so hard for, for me and the rest of my Latino community to say Job. 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 I always say that. Oh, God, forgive me. Have mercy on them. Jesus. And Job, he was a super rich person. Famous person. And Job comes and said this. Um, in, in Job 23.10 it says, but he knows where I am going. And when he tests me, he says, I will come out as pure, as gold. You want to buy gold from Jesus? He's telling them, you want to buy, come and buy gold from me. Let me test you. 
Let me prove you. Let me allow you to go through some fires. I'm going to show you that it's there. It's not just a living a comfortable life. Let me walk with you. Let me, let me test what you're going through. Are you with me, church? You may be going through a test, a moment of test right now. You are going, you may be, some of you may be going like, why, when is this going to change Jesus? When is it? I come, I serve you, I love you, I, 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 I'm faithful with my giving, I'm doing everything. When is this going to change? And you are going through a moment and test. I will say to you, if you're going through a moment of hardship right now, just stay faithful. Remain faithful. Maybe he's testing you because he wants to form in you that character, the character of Jesus inside of you. Are you with me, church? Just remain faithful. The Bible says that he disciplined those who he loves. We just read it. He disciplines the ones who he loves. There is a moment in there that he wants to test you. Job said this, I have money, I'm famous, but you know what? I'm also going through the test, and I'm also, Father, test me. It's like that moment. Some of you, some of us need to come and say, God, will you test my heart? You know, I often come when I'm preaching. I often come when I'm doing something. Uh, I'm excited about the new location. I often come to God and say, God, examine my heart. I don't want pride to come into my life. Just the same way as when things don't go right and nobody shows up and things fail and things are not going the way I wanted to plan. I don't also want failures to come and, and, and detect who I, how I'm feeling or who I am. I said, God, would you, would you allow me to be faithful? Would you allow me to be persistent in loving you? I love how Job, we can learn these things from Job. You know that Job was tested in two different things. And these are the two different things that, that you can be tested with. I want to say this to you all here. There are two different things. One is pro popularity and prosperity. Popularity and prosperity will test you. It tested the church of Laodicea and they were failing. But Job said, no, I will, I, will, I, will, I will be here. I love you. I worship you. You read the life of Job. He was so prosperous and so rich. But every single day he worshiped Jesus. He worshiped God. Another thing is in difficulties, in dissolutions, you also will be tested. When you are about to quit, when things are not going right, you will be tested. Trials are not just in the difficult times. It's also in the prosperous times. How are you doing right now? Are you, are you doing well? Are you signing contracts? Are you making the millions? Everything feels like, seems like you are on top of the mountain. How is your relationship with Jesus then? How, are, you, are you giving grace and I mean, praise to the Lord? Are you saying thank you, Jesus, for everything that you're doing? Is he still the number one in your life? You're going through a hard moment right now. You're just about to quit. Are you being remain, remaining faithful in those moments as well? Those are the two different things. Job 1, 20 to 21, it says here, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped because the enemy came and said to God, Oh, he's doing well. Why? Because he has everything. And Jesus said, God said to the devil, no, he is faithful. He's faithful to me. And then I love this moment here because it says here, Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb. He says, and naked shall I return. But the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. They will take everything I have away. How would you act if everything that you have right now is taken away? Everything. How would every single person here act? If everything we have, just imagine for two seconds, you leave this place and you have nothing. Because that was the life of Job. Everything that you formed that you made with your own hands, the, the years of sacrifice is gone. And I love what Job says. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. But listen to this attitude. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. 
2, buy from me garments. It says here in Revelations 3.18, also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. You know, it's talking about white garments. It's not talking about the, 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 um, the righteousness of the believer. We are, we are righteous because of his righteousness. Amen? We don't buy righteousness. We are righteous because of his righteousness, what he has done on the cross, and by us believing. But they have lost their righteousness among the people in their city. They have become a church. They have become a church that were so preoccupied in their own things, and they forgot about the poor and about the widow and the widows. And you know, you know what I'm saying. They forgot to impact the people outside. They were keeping it just in, in their own church. And God forbid us to be a church that only receives the blessings. And everything that we experience is just here. I love how it, 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 was, it was taken uh, to uh, Jesus was telling them, you are righteousness. Buy from me white garments. Dress yourself with righteousness. Not only before me. I, I gave you that righteousness. But before the people. And look what Job says here in Job 29, 11 to 16. I'm trying to go really fast here because we don't usually go past 12 and it's 12 or 5, which is good. You, 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 can, you can stay here. <laughs> the pizza will taste better after this. Um, it says here in Job 29, 11 to 16, it says, All who hear me praise me. That's what Job says. Like, they say, man, you're doing so well. All who saw me spoke well of me. He had that white righteous robe. Then the church of Laodicea did not have anymore. He says, why? Why do you praise me? Why you so? You spoke well of me. For I assisted the poor in their need. And the orphans who require help. I was using the money that you gave me to be a blessing. You know, it's a challenge for the church. We need money to fix that place, but not on the expenses of becoming less impactful in outside of our church. Let's not use all the money. Oh, my goodness, we raised tons of money just for our location. And what about the poor? What about the widow? What about the broken? What about the ones in need? What about the ones who need a meal? What about the ones who need help? What about the single mom who comes here to this church perhaps and needs somebody to help them? Cutting the lawn and doing something. Are you with me, church? What if we become an active church that is a blessing, not only inside here, but outside as well? I love this, 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 how Job says here, I assisted the poor in their needs and the orphans who require help. I help those without hope and they... Bless me. And it says, and they bless me. It says, I cause the widow's hearts to sing for joy. I love that. Everything I did was honest. Righteousness covered me like a robe. Like that white robe that you're talking about, Jesus. And like I wore justice like a turban. It was there in my head. It was there in my body. I showed it. I served as eyes for the blind, as feet for the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I assisted strangers who needed help. Job was the ideal of a church that Laodicea did not have. Job was a man who served the Lord with every, in every single way. And that is one of the things that God wanted us. Another thing is put oil in your eyes. And oilman in your eyes, they had that physical. They were famous for their oilman that they used to sell among the regions. But they forgot how to see with God's perspective. Are you with me, church? Job 42.5. As the worship team to just come so I can finish. <laughs> Job 42.5. I have heard about you before. I love this scripture. This scripture is one of my favorite scriptures. The scripture is one of my favorite scriptures. Why? Because for a long time, 
I only knew God from what I heard others. I remember when I just gave my life to Jesus and my pastor, he wasn't, he wasn't an experienced preacher. He, he was an old man. Back then he was younger. I saw him as an old man. I was young. He, he always tell us stories. And I remember going to conference, youth conference, and I heard the preachers preach amazing stories. And I always heard the stories. But I've never experienced God on my own. And I remember going and, and just reading books or even the Bible. That God healed the sick and delivered the, the, the demon-possessed people. And, and, and healed the brokenhearted. And I remember hearing the stories and after stories. To the point that one time I remember very well in my, in my bedroom upstairs. And I was saying, God, am I praying to somebody? Are you listening? I don't know you well. I hear of you. Am I talking just to the air? Do you exist? Are you real? Now remember that the warmth of his presence that just came inside of me. That boldness inside of me that, and I went and prayed for somebody. I remember we it was our meetings were on a Saturday night. And our pastor led us to this young girl who was demon possessed. I was 17 years old. I have no experience. And some of you are getting scared right now just by me saying that. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this group of young kids with our guitar out of tune, singing out of tune, began to praise. And this little girl was just convulsing, demon possessed. And we start praying and we start singing. And I remember the pastor said, just plead the blood of Jesus. And then I go, not just me, but it's like, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus. You devil have no power and authority over this person. She's covered with the blood of Jesus. And we began to pray. And all of a sudden, this girl goes, wow. <gasps> It gets completely delivered like that. I, man, you will really be excited if you were there in that room. Completely delivered in the name of Jesus. A bunch of little teenagers who were hungry for the experience of the hearing about you. Do I want to see you? These people of the Laodicea had that beautiful ointment and can use it in your eyes so you can naturally see, but they lost the sight of the supernatural because they excluded Jesus out of the equation, out of the everyday life. And people, I'll tell you something. There are going to be tribulations. There are going to be persecutions. There are going to be things that are going to happen in our society nowadays. And the only thing that is going to make you stand firm is when you have a personal experience with Jesus. Bottom line. When you have, when you've seen, then you've seen it, then you've seen it, and it works in you. Then it's more than a fairy tale. Then it's more than it's a God that is outside of this book into your life. Are you with me, church? Then it's not just a God who people preach from this book, but it's a God who can be with you in every day in your businesses, in your schools, in your financial needs, in your financial successes, in your story. He wants to be there. He wants to write your story with you. He wants to be a true, faithful witness with you. He just don't wasn't what it was. Wants you to know him as the beginning and the end. He wants to be there every single day of your life. He wants to be involved in your life. He wants to be you to say like Job. He says, I used to know you by the hear you, by the hearing. But now my eyes 
I see you. I, 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 I want to stop right there. You, you go and read, finish the book. Finish the, finish the letter. And he said, those who conquer, they will sit with me in, in the throne of my father. Just like I sat in the throne of my father when I conquered. There is a battle to fight in front of you. And it's up to you if you want to conquer or not. There's a battle that you're fighting right now. Distractions, success, or failure that have become a distraction in your life. And Jesus is saying to you, make me your number one. And I will walk hand by hand with you through the ups and the downs. And you will become successful. And you will become victorious with me. And you're going to sit with me in the throne of my Father. Can you please stand up right there where you are? There are people here in this place. I don't want to rush with this because this is so important. This is life. Your life depends on this. And I'm saying that with my with humility in my whole heart. But for so long, Jesus has been knocking on your door. He wants to bless you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to do something in your life. He wants to walk with you. He wants to be a witness in everything that you do. He wants to be present. He has no problem with what you have. And it breaks his heart if you're going through something difficult in your life. He wants to get you out of there. It's a moment of trial. And it is a test that we all need to pass. You can leave this church and go to another place where they speak more soft and all that. And all, and all of that is good. But if you are in the middle of a test, you will not move up to another level until you pass the test. His way is almost like the Mexican way, school system. <laughs> Not like the Canadian school system. When we, when we move from Canada, they put our kids based on their age. Oh, no, he's 10, he's going to this. Yeah, but he's still in grade 4. No, he's going to grade 6. Or something like that. 5. Yeah, but it's according to their age. No. In Mexico, you go to the next level if you pass the level that you are in. If you are in grade 5, you're going to level... Grade 6 until you pass grade 5. In God is the same way. If you are going through a test, when you're up or down, you will only move up if you pass the test. And he is knocking on your door because he wants you to pass the test. He's knocking on your door right now. So if you are there, whoever you are, please close your eyes, wherever you are here in this place. Some of you is on to salvation. You've been walking. He's been telling you to give your life to Jesus, and you've been walking in disobedience. You're trying to do life in your own. You have not acknowledged that you need God, and you need to give your life to Jesus right now. Some of you are unsuccessful. You don't pray anymore. You don't tie. You don't give because you think the money is yours. And you have, you don't, the, the church, giving to the church means nothing. And it's like, you don't give, you become a stingy, has become your God. And you need to repent and give. Some of you are going through a hard time, a difficult moment. You're about to quit. You don't want to, you don't know where you're going. You've been faithful and serving and giving and obeying. But you're going through a test and you don't know what to do. Hang on. And come to Jesus. Let him come in. He wants you to pass the test. So, right there where you are, lift up your hands. Whoever you are, if that's you, if you're going through a moment, just lift up your hands right now. And say, God, come into my life. I invite you to be a part of my life. I want to know you as the beginning. I want to know you as the end. But I want to know you as friend as well. You're my friend. I want to share things with you. I want to walk with you. 
I want to process things with you. I want to do business with you first. I want to hear your voice first. I want you to say, go, and I will go. I want you to say, stop, and I will stop. I don't just want to go and then realize you weren't there and then come back for help. <laughs> Though you are good and you help. But we want to have a relationship with God. We obey. You, we go where you say we go. We stop when you say we stop. We want to be a friends with you, God. Just ask him to be your friend right there where you are. Lift up your, your voice, your hands. This is God. Can you be my friend? I want to I want to make you my best friends. I want you to be the first one that I come to in the mornings, in the evenings. I give you my life. I give you my life. I give you my life. God. We give you this church. May this church, may Connection Church be a church that depends on the presence of the Holy Spirit and the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to compromise with the world. We don't want to do things to please the world so we can gain people. No, we want to walk in obedience to your word even if the world comes against us. We want to remain faithful. We want to live for you and for nobody else. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
a blessed week, everyone. Go connect with somebody out there. And let's get into the word this week. Let's be encouraged. And what a challenge we have in front of us. And I don't know about you, but I want to embrace this with all of my heart. Amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you next week. Don't forget, Easter Sunday, bring someone, baptisms, lunch.